on April 12, 2014, the James A. Michener Art Museum held a symposium on the 20th century American furniture designer, Paul Evans. This is a lecture by the museum's curator of collections, Constance Kimmerly. Constance Kimmerly has been curator of collections at the Michener Art Museum since 2001. In addition to curating numerous exhibitions, she is the author of the catalog that accompanied the 2004 retrospective of the work of Pennsylvania Impressionist Edward Redfield, as well as the catalog accompanying the 2007 retrospective of the work of modernist artist Elsie Driggs. Most recently, she organized the Paul Evans retrospective and edited and contributed an essay for the publication accompanying that exhibition. Kimberly earned her master's and PhD degrees from the University of Pennsylvania, where she concentrated on material culture and American art. Prior to her appointment at the Michener, she was a National Endowment for the Arts Curatorial Fellow at the Philadelphia Museum of Art and held curatorial positions with the Robert L. McNeil Americana Collection and the Rosenbach Museum and Library. Her presentation today will focus on how Paul Evans navigated his career within the rapidly evolving marketplace in the early years of the American studio craft movement as he capitalized on the opportunities afforded craftspeople in the prosperous mid-century environment. Please welcome Connie Kimberly. Evans reached adulthood at mid-century when the United States was making the transition from a war to peacetime economy and American factories were achieving record-breaking levels of production. Glossy magazines and colored supplements in American newspapers translated the American dream as an opportunity for the American family to constantly acquire new goods to fill their homes. In 1950, it was not unreasonable for one to fear that handcraft goods and individual creativity might be lost in a world focused on efficient management and ever increasing consumption of factory products. Nonetheless, in this dynamic post-World War II environment, a market for studio craft was just beginning to develop. This morning, I'd like to take a few minutes to explore how Evans navigated his career within the rapidly evolving marketplace in the early years of the studio craft movement as he capitalized on the opportunities afforded craftspeople in the prosperous mid-century environment. In 1951, Evans was awarded an I. O. Webb scholarship to study at Rochester Institute of Technology School for American Craftsmen. Widely regarded as one of the most influential advocates of the craft movement in America, Eileen Osborne Webb figured prominently as a major supporter of Evans during his student years at SAC and in his transition from student to designer craftsman. It was Webb's mission to help craftspeople make a good living by providing them with the education, networking, and retailing skills necessary to survive in industrial post-war America. She also spearheaded the formation of America House in 1940, one of the earliest mid-century retail shops to specialize in American crafts of all media, as well as New York's Museum of Contemporary Crafts, which opened in 1956. Evans was fortunate indeed to have been awarded a Webb Scholarship at RIT. It was here that he not only cultivated a relationship with Eileen Webb, but also learned to market himself as a craftsman, and where he was afforded opportunities to participate in shows at America House, to prepare students for careers as self-employed designer craftsmen, designer technicians in industry, or teachers of craft, Sachs production program offered students the opportunity to design, produce, price, and market their work through America House, which functioned as a merchandising laboratory where students could exhibit and sell their work. While at SAC, Evans studied with American silversmiths and designers John Tripp and Lawrence Copeland, both of whom were greatly influenced by contemporary Scandinavian design. His student journeyman's piece was a silver coffee service with ebony handles, which combined elements of traditional classical American colonial design 
the sleek streamlined forms inspired by contemporary Scandinavian design. And the coffee pot from that service would garner of its first prize in the competition known as the Young Americans Exhibition held at America House in New York in 1952. By the time of his graduation, Evans had sold his work not only to Eileen Webb, but to the president of RIT. And here we see Evans surrounded by some of the flatware and hollowware he produced while at SAC. Now in the fall of 1952, Evans moved on to the Cranbrook Academy of Art in Bloomfield Hills, Michigan. His studies at Cranbrook not only included metalsmithing with Richard Thomas, but also exposed him to the world of art outside the realm of metalsmithing. However, his stay at Cranbrook was fairly short-lived. In the spring of 1953, he left Cranbrook to assume a position selling his work as a living craftsman in the metal shop at Old Sturbridge Village. It would be his first commercial venture working as a full-time independent craftsman. Here, he not only produced hollowware and flatware based on traditional classical American colonial design, but also created sleek, streamlined forms inspired by contemporary Scandinavian design, while also selling his designs for manufacturing in Denmark, Sweden, Italy, and Japan. At Sturbridge, Evans began what was to become a lifelong passion, experimenting and developing new approaches to finishing metal. His early experiments included sandblasting the surfaces of pewter works. And here we have surviving work from this period, which includes a pewter and rosewood pitcher in a streamlined modern style, as well as a sandblasted pewter candlesticks and a silver pen crafted in a starburst form that Evans would later use as a design for a high relief ornamental element on his forge flat cabinets in the 60s. After three years at Sturbridge, Evans was feeling the need for more creative stimulation in a new environment. He left Old Sturbridge Village to share a showroom with woodworker Philip Lloyd Powell in New Hope, Pennsylvania. Powell would later recount how Evans walked into his showroom one summer Saturday night, sick and tired of making Paul Revere bowls at Sturbridge. As Powell noted, Evans was amazed at seeing people who had come from Philadelphia and New York to attend his show at the Bucks County Playhouse, buying like crazy at 1 a.m. in the morning. On the screen is an image of the earliest Pal and Evans showroom with furniture displayed in domestic arrangements on a pebbled floor, which according to Pal, not only made it easier to clean up after the frequent floods, but was also a device for actually keeping people in the showroom to talk. During this period, the bread and butter for Evans' early sales was the income received from his line of menorahs, with simple brass bobeshes set into walnut bases. The menorahs were sold at the Powell and Evans showroom and through such mass market retailers as Macy's. Despite sharing a showroom from 1955 until 1966, Evans and Powell always maintained separate workshops. Nonetheless, the two men successfully collaborated on specific works, with Powell early on encouraging Evans to not only make sculptures for the chess he was creating, but experiment with other metals like brass, copper, and iron. In 1957, a Powell and Evans walnut chest embellished with a sculptured metal front was included in the Museum of Contemporary Crafts Furniture by Craftsmen exhibition, a show that highlighted the work of nearly 40 woodworkers, including such studio furniture makers as Warden Eschrick, Kay Free, Sam Roof, and George Nakashima. Other early Powell Evans collaborations included wooden frame screens that incorporated steel loops and slate top tables with tiered steel loop bases. In 1959, Dorsey Redding became one of Evans' first employees, and in that same year, the Evans shop was producing metal patchwork cabinets that started as wooden cases, which were then clad with patchwork copper and thin gauge braised steel squares then finished on the surfaces with splashed pewter. Now, Evans and Powell not only collaborated on individual works, they also installed complete interiors for clients, one of their earliest being in 1960 for the Princeton, New Jersey couple Norman and Rena and Dictor. As Dorsey Redding recalls, 
Paul and Phil were a perfect tag team as each worked over a prospective customer to seal the deal. <laughs> Newly married and with plans for opening a gallery in their home for arts and crafts, oriental art, and modern paintings, the inductors discovered the Paladin showroom on an outing to New Hope. On learning of their gallery plans, Paul entered into an agreement to develop a furnishing plan for $100, which he ultimately parlayed into a $2,500 commission. Assuring the couple that they would not really get much furniture, but that the environment would be fantastic, Paul closed the deal. The indictors were overjoyed with the resulting decorative scheme and furnishings, which included such new furnishings as antique oriental rugs, walnut shelves with welded metal pole supports for display of their arts and crafts inventory, a metal loop room divider, and an angle wire coffee table with cleft slate top. Powell and Evans would subsequently refurbish and finish the interiors of the Indictors' homes both in Brooklyn and Manhattan. And Norman and Rita described Paul as a virtuoso in understanding how to relate one thing to another, especially the placement of objects in space. As Norman subsequently recalled, both Phil and Powell were not interested in making a quiet statement. It was going to challenge you. In 1961, Evans and Powell were invited to exhibit their work in New York at America House. Just like the MoMA Good Design shows of the same period, the America House exhibitions offered designer craftsmen opportunities to display and market their work while also encouraging the acceptance of modern design in American culture. It was the America House show that Evans debuted his technique for producing forged front screens with high relief abstract ornamental elements and diverse color and patina variations. And the show received glowing press reviews from publications such as the New York Times, the Christian Science <coughs> Monitor, Interiors Magazine. And Evans and Powell's careers were boosted substantially as a result of all this attention in the press. Despite ending his professional relationship with Powell in 1966, the decade of the 60s was an incredibly creative time for the Evans shop. It not only marked the beginning of his relationship with Directional Furniture Company, it was also a period in which he produced some of his finest studio furniture and sculpture in the Appleton Road shop just outside New Hope. This shop, which included as many as 10 employees by 1966, was Evans' prototyping shop, where his staff developed ingenious techniques to manipulate materials in such a way as to create expressive surfaces and forms with highly charged visual presences. By the mid-60s, Evans was experimenting with a new technique to create welded aluminum sculpture and furniture. He introduced a new Argente technique in a mid-60s show devoted to his work at America House. This highly experimental technique involved shaping the metal, blackening it with colored pigments, sanding and buffing it, texturing the surface with a torch, and then etching the surface. And here on the screen is an Argente screen from his 1968 uh, Sculptures in the Field series. During the early 60s and into the 70s, Evans and his specialized staff were crafting unique forged front screens, cabinets, and collages. To create a forged front cabinet, one individual fabricated the cabinet's wooden carcass, another clad the plywood box with metal, and then another welded decorative elements onto the cabinet's front metal surface. These decorative elements were finished in a final step that included the application of heavy oil pigments, which were then treated with heat and acid to create crusty textured multicolored surfaces. Even as the staff of the Zacraton Road workshop continued to grow, Evans invested in his work with such signs of individual creativity and human touch. One quite unusual sculpted front cabinet is this Evan Skyline cabinet, which is in the show, a welded and patinated cabinet with its main body simulating a mass of crowded architectural forms with spiking rooftops. A restless artist, Evans was always looking, as he himself noted, to diversify in hundreds of ways, and his dynamic career reflected that urge when by the end of the 60s, his career had spanned the domains of metalsmith, furniture maker, and designer. In 1964, 
Evans joined forces with Directional Furniture, a partnership that would significantly alter the nature and scope of his furniture production over the next 15 years. The Directional showrooms, located in major urban areas, offered Evans opportunities for marketing and selling his work throughout the United States, even as the business demanded that he continuously introduce new lines and significantly increase production capability. With increasing sales from Directional, by 1965, Evans opened an additional workshop in Lambertville, New Jersey, and added up to 18 employees in order to keep up with the growing demand for his direction of line. Now it was at this time that Evans began producing his sculpted bronze line for directional, which involved applying epoxy resin over a plywood base or steel frame. The resin was then sculpted in a freehand form, sandblasted and coated with atomized bronze. Evans used this technique mainly for his directional work. Popular forms crafted in the technique for directional were his sculpted bronze disc bars. He also used the technique to craft such unique studio sculptural works as the cat cat that you see here for his wife, Bunny. By 1970, Evans found it necessary to relocate his Lambertville shop to a larger building in Plumsteadville, Pennsylvania, in order to keep up with the growing demand for his directional lines. As demand accelerated, the workforce steadily increased to 25 by 1969. The original 12,000 square foot shop soon expanded another 10,000 square feet for a woodworking shop with 10 benches that handled the casework required for much of the directional furniture production. As Evans' production facilities grew and his work with directional became more recognized, the local Trenton Times newspaper highlighted his employment practice of hiring workers with negligible production experience. Noting that the specialized production departments of Evans Production Facility required processes too complicated and too secret to be described, the article cited how each worker was schooled on the job for each particular step in the production process. Despite the growing demands of the directional market, Evans did continue to produce in a dedicated space within the Plumsteadville facility, such custom studio furniture as this magnificent vertical standing forge front cabinet with an explosion of forms placed within an intricately confined spaces. In 1971, Directional introduced Evans' minimalist brass and chrome Cityscape 1 series. Uh, this series was a prolific line that features smooth, reflective surfaces as seen on the pair of prototype Cityscape 1 wall-hung cabinets on the left here on the screen. The successful development of this line was the result of much experimentation to find the best way to get the patchwork metal pieces to stick to the surface of the wooden carcasses. Notably different from the cluttered and logistic approach of the studio sculpted steel work of the 60s are the gleaming facades of these works. In 1973, Directional introduced the Cityscape 2 series, which included faceted cabinets that incorporated the geometry of cubism, you see here. By 1975-76, the Evans Craft Factory was at its peak, and the workforce reached 88, with people working in two shifts. Evans ended his relationship with Directional uh, some three years later in 1979. And the split was basically due to a change in directional management. Evans wanted to create a new line of furniture using a malleable aluminum composite material called a Lucabon. And he was also interested in experimenting with mechanisms to animate uh, furniture. Following the split with directional, Evans opened a retail showroom in Midtown Manhattan, where he offered a Lucabon furniture with electronic furniture. <coughs> The showroom featured such whimsical works with pop imagery as a large metal chicken with a bar under its wing, a figure chair, and a voluptuous S-curved sofa. When the New Hope showroom closed in 1983, Paul and son Keith founded Zoom, Incorporated, to focus on electronic furniture. They also began a relationship with Design Institute America where they developed designs for furniture that was produced by DIA. The DIA lines ranged from kinetic furniture 
the 10 foot square rooms that revolved by means of hydraulic systems. The furniture produced post directional is quite scarce. Uh, we have one surviving work in the show dating to circa 1986. It's an electronic turning column crafted of reverse painted plexiglass. By 1987, Evans was deeply in debt, having borrowed at then current interest rates of 19 to 22 percent in order just to keep his operations going. He decided to retire and actually suffered a fatal heart attack in his first day of retirement. The artist who had crossed so many boundaries during his career was described posthumously by his friend Phil Powell as a man who had always danced at the volcano's edge. Over the course of four decades, Paul had evolved from metalsmith to furniture maker to designer as the studio grew from a small shop to a factory. Constantly experimenting with new materials and techniques, his work was quite distinctive in the realms of craft and design. His success as a creative craftsman can ultimately be traced to a number of both general and specific causes or factors. His formal education as a metalsmith, tutelage and marketing by Eileen Osborne Webb, his association with Philip Lloyd Powell, his fostering of a workshop environment that encouraged experimentation, his own unfettered creative drive, and finally, his ability to capitalize on opportunity during the prosperous times of mid-century America. Well, it's all scattered. Dorsey Redding, who was Evans' shop manager for some 20 years, has a fabulous archival collection that we have on loan here uh, at the Mishnah that uh, many of us use for research. And the American Craft Council has archives out in Minneapolis. Uh, Cranbrook uh, also has some archival material, and the Rochester Institute of Technology, the School for American Craftsmen. How old was Evans when he retired and subsequently had a heart attack? I believe he was 57. Okay. Yeah, very unfortunate that he died at such a young age. Well, I know Dorsey certainly worked for a while after Paul Evans uh, closed his facilities. Uh, yeah, Dorsey ready. <laughs> Thank you so much.